Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming out to my session. I'm uh, so glad to see that the, the room has filled up quite nicely with uh, both people and smoke. Um, thank you so much for, for joining me today for, uh, for this session. So my name is Don. Um, I'm a developer uh, advocate on the developer relations team uh, and also an engineer. Uh, and it's my job today uh, to present you uh, the Slack platform, an overview of the platform if you're not uh, overly familiar with it, uh, and to help you understand uh, what the Slack platform is, how you can use it, uh, and what it's good for. So we've seen this once already today, of course, but it bears repeating. Um, our mission. Uh, our mission is to make people's working lives simpler, more pleasant, and more productive. Um, and this uh, underlies everything that we do at Slack. It's very, very important to us that every decision we make, uh, every outcome that we create uh, is uh, aligned with this mission. Um, and this applies equally well to uh, our work on the platform, as well as the other things that we do. Um, and so one way to think about it is, is, is this. We live in an exciting time for work. Um, there are dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands of apps out there that are uh, uh, incredibly powerful tools uh, that people use at work to be more productive. Um, but they all suffer from one flaw, uh, which is that they don't really work well together. Uh, and this is where Slack comes in. Slack provides a mechanism uh, to bring these apps together uh, and to um, um, uh, allow them to uh, compose into workflows that you can use to be uh, more productive. Um, and this is really important to us because it means even, even small improvements uh, in the workflows that you create with these tools um, is just going to make your working lives that much easier. So Slack is where apps for work work together. Uh, we think of Slack, as uh, April has said, and as Stuart has said before, as the operating system for your business. Uh, the command center for uh, all of your team to communicate together and to communicate with the services and tools that you use. And so this is where the platform comes in. And today I want to talk about um, how you can take advantage of this, uh, how you can build upon it. Uh, first, I want to draw a distinction. Uh, so when we talk about uh, integrations with Slack, there are actually two different types of things that you can do with the Slack platform. Um, the first are Slack apps. And Slack apps are great uh, because they allow you to uh, write an integration and share it with other teams. Custom integrations, on the other hand, work very much the same way, but they're designed just for your team. Uh, they're designed to connect Slack to the bespoke systems that you use already at work, but that are unique to your team in particular. And all the things that I talk about that follow uh, work equally well under each of these uh, different types of integrations. But I mention it here because we're going to sort of go back and forth between the two as we talk. Uh, I want to clear up any, any confusion that might arise from that. So let's talk for a moment about the Slack platform features. There are three mechanisms in particular that you can use to interact with Slack uh, from your, uh, your code. Uh, the first one is notifications. Then we have slash commands and also bots. And I'm going to talk about these uh, in some detail. So notifications are the simplest kind of integration with Slack. Uh, it's basically a way for you to drop messages into Slack uh, and to do so in a way that provides structured information that's very easy to visually parse. Uh, so here's an example of one. You'll notice it's not a wall of text, uh, but it's got some structure to it. And you can see very quickly this is a, a Google Calendar uh, notification letting us know that we have a meeting starting in 15 minutes, which is unfortunate because we're here at this talk. Um, but you can see it's got that information there very readily. There's uh, clear links to get more information. Um, it's designed to be easily uh, and readily uh, digestible. Um, here's another example of, a, of an app that uses notifications. So in our office, we use Envoy. Um, if you're not familiar with Envoy, uh, it's an app uh, for iOS uh, that lets you sign in visitors at your desk. So you have an iPad sitting there. Uh, guest walks up to it. And they interact with it, they give it their name, it takes a picture, maybe they sign an NDA, and it, they say that they're here to see, uh, for example, me. Um, and when they uh, do that, then uh, I get a notification inside of Slack that says this visitor is here to see me. Um, and I see all of the information about who it is, and I get the picture too, so I can pick them out of a crowded, uh, a crowded um, uh, lobby. So notifications are great for sending structured information. Um, and they're better than email notifications because email notifications, for one thing, you never know when they get delivered. For another thing, you don't know who sees them. You don't know who reads them. You don't know who acts on them. But with notifications, of course, they go into a shared channel uh, where all of your team is sitting. 
Uh, and you know who's read them, you know who's interacted with them, you know what actions that they've taken in response to them. So notifications are a great way uh, to organize your team uh, around your tools. If you want to build a notification, they're relatively straightforward to build. Uh, of course, uh, you'll need uh, some sort of server, uh, and we have a server there too, and we'll provide you with a webhook when you create a, a notification app. Um, and you'll simply call this webhook and send in the notification you want posted into Slack. Um, and as a matter of fact, we're gonna do a live demo now. We'll act as though we're good. So here's our demo Slack team. It's a blank slate. We can do whatever we like with it. Uh, I'm gonna build a very simple notification custom integration. I'm building custom integration simply because they're slightly less complicated, much easier to put together in a demo environment as a result. Um, and I'm gonna put together um, a notification that will dump just a sample uh, message in this channel. And I'm thinking about, uh, as I often do, trains. Uh, and I'm thinking about the train I use to get home, which is not the central line, uh, but the Richmond line in, uh, in San Francisco. And wouldn't it be nice if I could get, because they don't come every three minutes in San Francisco, they come every 15 to 20 minutes, if I could get a little notification telling me uh, when my next train is so I know when to run out of the office so I don't end up standing at the station for 20 minutes. So the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna design the message first. Um, and this is what it looks like. Um, it's JSON, it's a JSON blob. Uh, and we define uh, certain attributes inside of this. So uh, we've given it a very boring username. Um, it's got a little emoji icon. It's got a bit of text that's gonna go at the top. And then it has a range of attachments. And attachments, uh, as you saw in some of the, the other examples, are little uh, blobs of text that are set aside. They have a little colorful bar next to them. Um, and so maybe here are the next three trains departing from my station. Those times are extremely optimistic. Um, so that's what that looks like. So first we need to tell Slack that we want to create a custom integration. So I'm gonna click on the, the uh, team menu right here. We're gonna choose apps and integrations from there. This is gonna take us to the app directory, but we're actually going to build our own. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, we're gonna build this one as a custom integration, but everything I do here you can do in an app as well, of course. Now notifications are implemented as incoming webhooks, so we'll create an incoming webhook. And we'll need to choose a channel for these notifications to go into, so I've set up the notification channels just for this purpose. We'll click add incoming webhooks, and here's our webhook. So we just need to make note of this. And because all we're doing is uh, posting to a webhook, we don't even have to write a line of code. I'm just gonna dump this into a, a curl command line, which I have conveniently queued up right here. And there it is. So there's the notification inside Slack. Uh, we've got uh, three different uh, uh, notific or, um, attachments, as I mentioned earlier. We've color-coded them according to the urgency with which I need to run out of the office to get to the train. Um, and after this, it's very, very straightforward to hook this up to your favorite API for tracking transit, perhaps, um, and then uh, uh, get triggered by external events and start dumping notifications uh, into Slack. So, if you're thinking about adding notifications into your app or custom integration, um, and uh, being the most basic way that you'll interact with Slack, I'm, I'm sure you are, uh, we have some tips and tricks for you. The first of which is format your response. So, uh, in the demo that I gave, and the examples I gave earlier, we didn't just throw a wall of text, right, into Slack. We didn't just put words up there that you have to read out very carefully uh, to extract the meaning from. We use the structure and visual cues that uh, Slack message formatting provides in order to make these messages readily and easily uh, digestible quickly. Uh, and we encourage you to do the same. Second, we encourage you to digest instead of spamming. Um, so uh, I, I talked with a, a startup a few days ago that had um, this incoming webhook notification system um, that was just dumping um, message after message after message, like literally every few seconds there's a new message coming into this channel. And they told me they just started ignoring the channel uh, because th there's, there's no useful information at that point. Uh, it's, just, it's just too much to follow. Uh, each piece that comes in is, is too little to be meaningful. Um, and I encourage them to, to digest. In, in this case, uh, to maybe once an hour or once a day, post a single summary 
of all the events that they were just dumping into the channel, uh, and maybe even do some analytics over them, right, to provide some insight into what's going on. This is far more useful for your customers uh, than just individual items being posted over and again. And finally, of course, consider the use of emojis. Uh, I don't have emoji cards up here to uh, pull you with, um, but uh, they're really useful in addition to being fun. Uh, they're colorful, and that splash of color is sometimes useful for drawing attention to certain things, but they also have meanings, um, and so they're, um, or, or they can be given meanings, I should say, um, and so they're a great way to present dense information in, a, in, again, a very readily digestible form. So we've talked about notifications. Uh, let's talk now about the second kind of interaction, or, uh, integration, uh, the slash command. So whereas notifications are just uh, your app pushing uh, messages into a channel, slash notifications introduce a, a degree of interactivity. So with the slash command now, users can make requests to your app or your integration, and you can, excuse me, you can post back in response to that. So here's an example of the Foursquare slash command. Now Foursquare, of course, is a service for searching for restaurants and other venues and things like that. And so um, the user might type uh, slash Foursquare business lunch in Miami, because why not Miami? Um, and Foursquare can come back with some results as a uh, result some results as a response to that. And it looks just like a notification, of course, because it, it is. Um, and again, they've used structure to indicate uh, uh, that we've got a couple of restaurants uh, that are options here. We have little icons uh, to show a preview of what the restaurant might look like. And they've even thrown in uh, some of their, their brand coloring in there as well, which is a nice touch. So if you're thinking about building a slash command, it's only slightly more complex than before. So uh, now you need to provide Slack, uh, a webhook. And when a user, or a customer rather, uh, invokes a slash command, we're going to um, invoke the webhook that you provide to us. And in your response, you include the message that you want to post back to Slack. And it's fairly straightforward. We're gonna try that out too in a demo. Hey, there we are. So um, here's our demo team again. Uh, another blank slate, we have a slash command channel here so that we can uh, create a slash command. And so what we're going to do here um, is we're first gonna just set up Slack. So we're again gonna go to the team menu. We're gonna choose apps and integrations. We're going to, sorry, build our own just like we did before and uh, we're going to make a custom integration just as before. Only this time now we're going to choose slash commands. Now Slack requires a little more information and it's gonna provide a little more feedback as well. We need to pick a name for our command, uh, which means first we need to decide what it's going to do. Since this is a demo, I'm gonna keep it simple. Uh, we're just gonna write a slash command that repeats back to me what I said to it. Pretty boring, but it'll get the point across. So we'll add this integration to Slack and we need to configure a few things here. So we've already named our slash command. We need to give it the URL of a webhook uh, on our server to hit. So I have that ready right here. I've got a little server running a PHP script ready to go. Uh, you can set that up as a post or a git. The token here is very important. I'm gonna ignore it in this demo, but when you're building your own, I strongly encourage you not to ignore it. Um, so again, we're asking you to create a public webhook, uh, which means that if somebody finds it, um, anybody can hit that webhook um, and spoof Slack. So every time Slack hits your webhook, it also passes along this token, which is a shared secret between you and Slack. And you should always check this and verify that it looks just like what you see on this page, and that way you'll know that it's actually Slack coming to your webhook. And if you don't see this token here, you don't see the correct token there, you should ignore it because it's somebody else. We can give it a custom name. I'll just do that. We can give it a custom icon. Do we want to vote on this? Should we? I like that one. Um, and we can um, um, give it a little um, feedback to the user. As they begin typing the slash command, uh, we can pop up a little autocomplete and hint window. Um, and so we'll give it a short description and a short usage hint, and we'll see that in action in Slack. Uh, so description echoes back what you type. Usage hint, um, your message. And we're gonna save it. And we're gonna go back to Slack. Now, 
sitting here on a server, I have this little tiny PHP script. And what it does right now uh, is it looks at the username who invoked the script, uh, which it gets right here, and it says back, hi there, username. So this isn't quite what we want yet, but we should test it out anyway. So we can say slash echo hello, and it comes back, hi there, Don, but it didn't echo back to me what I typed. So let's fix that. So we can get what the user typed as such. And we can just put that here. We'll save that. And now it should work. There we go. So it's going to be the next demo that fails, apparently. These two have worked great. I'm very excited. So this is how slash commands work. They're relatively simple to set up. You do have to have a webhook going on your server, but um, not too bad. So if you're thinking about uh, creating a slash command for your app or your integration, we have some tips and tricks for this as well. So one thing that we didn't talk about is consider delayed responses. So it might be that you can't uh, complete your response within the 200 millisecond window that we give you. So if you don't reply uh, to our HTTP request within 200 milliseconds, we take that as an error, uh, we shut down the connection, we send something ugly to the user instead of what you intended. Um, in many cases, that's fine. You can do what you want in 200 milliseconds. But if you need to call out to an external web service or perform some complex processing uh, or computation, um, we give you a mechanism so just reply with an OK and an empty response to the webhook. Um, and in the parameters that we send in, there's a, a webhook on Slack side that we give you. And you can use it just like you would, or more or less just like you would with, uh, with a notification. Um, you can use it up to five times over 30 minutes. And this gives you a mechanism for uh, uh, responding asynchronously to a slash command. Uh, we give it to you uh, five, to use five times so that if you want to do uh, status updates for a very long running job, for example, uh, you can post in several times to let uh, the customer know uh, that you're really working on it, you haven't ignored them or forgotten it. Uh, second, I want you to consider uh, thoughtful slash command naming. Right. So there's uh, uh, two things that you should think about in this case. One is that you don't want your slash command to be easily forgotten or difficult to discover. Uh, and two, you don't want it to be so common that when another app gets installed, it tries to claim the same slash command name uh, because then bad things happen, uh, at least to your slash command. It's the most recent one that's installed that has precedence. Um, so avoid generic verbs and nouns for your slash commands unless you're, you're fairly certain nothing will be installed that uses that. Um, and prefer things tied to your branding. Uh, so for example, uh, the Foursquare slash command that I showed you earlier, the command was slash Foursquare. Easy to remember uh, and perfectly descriptive of what it does. Finally, if you're building a service that has its own notion of uh, user accounts separate from uh, Slack user accounts, um, we encourage you to uh, consider linking the two. This is uh, not too terribly difficult to do. The, our customers um, have learn to expect this sort of behavior. Uh, and it can be a very powerful way, it can be a very powerful way to identify who's using your service. So um, if, for example, the first invocation by a new user that you don't recognize, you might, instead of completing the request, send them a link that they could click on. Um, and this will take them to your website where they could log in or you can read the cookie off of their, their browser to verify that they're logged in. And now you know this user on Slack uh, is this user in your system as well. Uh, and you can carry on with the transaction from there. So that's notifications, that's slash commands. Let's talk about now uh, bot users. So bots are really cool. Bots are in the news. Uh, bots are very exciting. Uh, but don't let the concept of bots intimidate you. So uh, in some sense, when a lot of us think about bots, we think about uh, advanced artificial intelligence and machine learning and HAL 9000. Try not to think about those. Uh, because while that's very cool and very uh, fun and experimental, bots have a much more uh, prosaic use, a much more everyday uh, use that uh, you might find a, a value. The key feature of bots is that they extend the interaction beyond the call and response of slash commands. So you can carry on an interaction over several messages. That's one feature. And bots also know the context of a conversation uh, and are capable of drawing upon that context and in, in, in formulating the, the way that they respond to things. And none of this necessarily requires any kind of advanced AI uh, or natural language processing. Um, so 
don't be intimidated by the idea of building a bot. Uh, think of them rather as simply an extended, well, I don't want to say an extended version of a slash command, but an extended interaction with the user. So here's an example of a bot that we have, uh, uh, we have running. It's called Howdy. Uh, it's by one of our partners, also named Howdy. Uh, and the bot runs stand-up meetings. And it's actually relatively straightforward in its operation. CC, hi CC. Um, has requested to run a check-in meeting um, uh, with these fine folks. Um, Howdy asks in return, well, what kind of check-in would you like to run? Uh, and then verifies with CC that the check-in is running. And then comes to each of us in a DM, asks us what we've been up to, collects those reports together, and then once it has all of them, it reports back to CC uh, on our behalf. And there's a, a nice uh, summary of the day's activities in the channel. Um, and it doesn't take a whole, whole lot of smarts to make this sort of thing work, but it's still really powerful and really useful. But how do you build one? Well, it's a little more complicated, unfortunately. Uh, but roughly speaking, um, you'll need to call out to our web API. We have an endpoint called RTM start, which is a request to start what we call a real-time session. What RTM start does is it sends you back the URL for a WebSocket. A WebSocket, if you don't know, is a, a kind of uh, internet connection that's long-lasting and bi-directional. So rather than a one-off HTTP request, it's a connection that you hold open for as long as you need it. And then, of course, you connect to the WebSocket URL, and we start the fire hose of messages and events to your server uh, that your bot can listen to. And so we're going to try a demo of a bot. So bots being what they are, um, I've actually already built and installed one on this team. We're not going to go through the whole process today. Um, and so I've called this bot Easy Peasy Bot, and we're just going to invite it into this channel and see what it can do. So it announces that it's here, and I can say hello, and it says hello back. And I'm not going to go through the rest. I'm just going to tell you the, 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 the punchline. That, that's all it can do. That's all it's capable of, and that's fine. Um, and here's the, the key bit of code. So um, this demo uses BotKit, uh, which is a Node.js framework for building bots. Um, and the core of the bot is this function right here, uh, controller.hears. And this sets up the bot to listen for a particular bit of text. In this case, it's listening for hello uh, at the beginning of a message. And it, in particular, it's listening, listening for hello as part of um, a message that's targeted at the bot. So either an at mention of the bot or a DM with the bot. That's what we have here. And then in response, it just says, hello back. It's very straightforward. So let's make, uh, let's make our bot uh, multilingual. So we have hello, that's American. Um, that looks more British. And for uh, our friends from Paris in the room, we'll add some French in there too. So this bot right now is being hosted uh, on a service called Beep Boop. And Beep Boop is great because one, it's Slack powered. Um, and two, because it uses bots to help you deploy your bots. It's very meta. Um, but it watches a GitHub repository that I've, I've got up, and all we have to do is make a change to that GitHub repository, commit those changes, uh, and the beep boot bot, bot will do its thing. <laughs> there we go. Yes, we'll commit that. You should see the commit history on this repo. And here we go. It's already started building. It's pushing out a Docker instance. It's finished building. Ah, and I think it's done. So we're going to go back to our team here, and we're going to try something new. I missed one. You mean here? Yeah. This won't be the f worst demo failure we've had. We'll just put that there. <laughs> Once again, it's going to go out. Hopefully, this won't take too, too long. It's actually usually pretty fast. There we are.
Oh, oh no. <laughs> well, the good news is I have something that should be working. What's all the difference? I don't, I mean, aside from the extra. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. There it is, yay. It just took a moment to reconnect. <laughs> this is the first time all three demos have m worked. <laughs> Outside of a rehearsal, when, uh, there's usually a 100% success rate. Mm. So, you want to build a bot. We have some tips and tricks for that too. Um, first of all, uh, we strongly encourage you to support feedback and help commands for your bot. So, uh, as you may have noticed, discovering bot functionality can be somewhat difficult. I mean, how would you know what that bot is capable of short of just trying out different things, right? Um, and so, sometimes users need help um, working with your bot. And so, uh, being able to respond to some kind of help command or help request uh, to get your customers going uh, is really great. Also, sometimes uh, people get stuck in conversations with bots, right? They, they end up in a bad place. Um, um, maybe a cycle in the conversation tree or some crazy dead end they didn't expect. Um, and so supporting a feedback command is really great too. So you can send some context uh, or get some context back from uh, uh, what happened in the conversation and see that something has gone wrong and maybe elicit some direct feedback from the user uh, so that you can uh, work to make your bot better in the future. Two, on installation, uh, we have some best practices and some anti-patterns, and an anti-pattern that's particularly uh, important is don't, don't DM everyone uh, on the team. Not at install time, not at ever. Uh, some of our teams will have thousands of people on them, and just one person installing your bot, and suddenly 4,000 people have a message from your bot saying, hi, I'm here, please use me, is actually really disorienting, um, and, and it might even trigger a security response if you're not careful. Uh, anyway, it leaves a bad taste in people's mouths, so don't do that. But do think very carefully about your onboarding experience. For example, it is okay, we think, uh, to DM uh, the person who installed the bot um, and provide them with uh, some hints and instructions, um, uh, maybe an invitation to invite the bot into some channels to be useful. That seems pretty reasonable. Uh, maybe also seed them with some basic ideas for usage as well, so they're not hitting the help command too, too quickly. So, slash commands sorry, notifications slash commands bots. Um, if you're ready to start building an app on Slack, uh, you're probably very interested in what we can do to promote it in the, the app directory. So the app directory, if you don't know already, uh, is Slack's primary mechanism for promoting your app. Uh, it's a collection of um, uh, the best apps for Slack out there, um, and yours can be here too. We've got over 385 apps in the app directory right now. Um, and many of them are names that you've already heard of, like Trello, Dropbox, Google Calendar, GitHub, and many of them are very new apps that are being built on Slack first, uh, like uh, 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 Birdly or Growbot. Um, we're very excited about the, the ecosystem that's uh, springing up around Slack, and uh, we want you to be a part of it too. Um, but if you have an aversion to leaving Slack, there is a slash command uh, for searching the app directory um, and installing apps uh, from within Slack. You never actually have to go to the web page. So slash apps, uh, followed by a search term, and uh, Slackbot will come back with what it finds. So if you'd like to be listed in the app directory, we have some tips and tricks for thinking about that too. Uh, so the first and most important of them is to request minimal scopes. So when you're designing an app for installation on other teams, you have to specify the degree and level of access that you want to a team. We call those scopes. Um, and the degree of access that you request should be consistent with the degree of access that your application requires to perform its desired functionality. If you're creating an app to post animated cat GIFs into channels, you probably don't need to be asking for message history. That sounds very suspicious. Users will pick up on that um, and they will not install your, your app. In fact, we, we won't even list it in the app directory in that case. Um, a thoughtful description is certainly a must. When uh, customers visit your app page, uh, you have your first chance to engage with them uh, with uh, what we call the, the app description. You should say something about what your app does. You should say something about why the customer would want to install it. 
Um, all too often, some people don't do that, and you wonder why would anybody even consider this app? They can't figure out what it's for. Uh, so this is your first chance to engage with, uh, with your potential customers. And by building an amazing install page, that's your, your, uh, your big chance to uh, uh, communicate with them. So when they hit the install link, uh, we actually take them back to your site. Uh, and at this point, you can do anything you like within the realm of HTML and CSS and JavaScript to really try to sell your app uh, to this customer, right? So um, all kinds of rich media, explainer videos, whatever you think is necessary to best communicate the value of your app. Um, and so these things are really uh, key parts of uh, seeing success uh, and being listed in the app directory. So let's talk now for a moment about how Slack helps apps work together. One of the key things that you should think about when building an app is how it's going to compose into a workflow that people, people use um, and that's going to make them more productive. Um, and so to inspire you and get you thinking about these sort of things, I want to uh, present a couple of these workflows. So let's think now about um, an engineer. Um, how many in the room are engineers? A few people. We'll have some non-engineering examples too, I, I, don't worry. But an engineer may begin um, his day by looking at, uh, at Trello. And uh, Trello, if you don't know, is a, a place uh, for project management. Uh, it divides tasks into cards, and people can claim cards, move cards around to indicate where they are um, in uh, the development process, and so on and so forth. And of course, there's a great Trello integration. So uh, as this engineer uh, starts his day, he may decide, um, I'm going to uh, pick this task. I'm going to assign myself to it and move it to the end development column. And the Trello integration will post notifications into the channel that uh, the task is being updated and changed. Uh, and uh, the fellow engineers can have conversations about that. Uh, second, uh, once the code is in a place where it might be complete, they might uh, push it out into GitHub, a code repository where uh, things like this are stored. Um, and again, there's an integration where the engineers can have a conversation around uh, the different changes that are being pushed into the repository um, and the, you know, maybe the consequences of those changes or whether they're appropriate uh, and just generally plan out uh, what they're working on together. And then finally, at the end of the day, our engineer deploys the code into production where uh, they're using a service called New Relic to monitor that code. And perhaps this code introduced a bug. Uh, New Relic detected this bug. Um, and New Relic can send notifications into the Slack channel that something has gone wrong and the engineers can rally around that uh, to solve that problem. So here's a, a non-engineering workflow, uh, a customer lifecycle workflow. Um, so we might imagine that uh, uh, when a customer is first interested in your product, they might visit your website. And maybe you use Intercom, which is a, uh, an app that you can install on your website to allow real-time chat between visitors to your website and your customer experience agents. Um, and we can capture that in Slack with the Intercom, uh, the Intercom app. Um, after, you've been, uh, after you've contacted them, uh, you add them maybe into your CRM, which can be integrated with Slack as well. You can assign these customers to account managers. You can move them through the, uh, uh, through the chain there. Um, and then from there you contact, or you nurture the contact, uh, perhaps with something like MailChimp, and you can track the email conversations that you have with this customer over MailChimp. Um, uh, so in, you know, in this example, uh, we show that uh, they've subscribed to one of your mailing lists. And then once they become a paid user, they might interact with you through, through Zendesk. So maybe the, uh, the bug that we deployed the other day now is suddenly a problem for your customer as well. And they open up a ticket with you. Um, and you can see uh, uh, all of this interaction in Slack as well through the Zendesk app. So as you can see, in each of these touch points, the contact is piped into Slack so that customer-facing teams can easily manage uh, and track your customer's lifecycle. So we want you to join us as we build the future of work. Um, together. Uh, and so this is something that's uh, very important to us, this idea of uh, working on this together. Um, and so uh, we've recently released the, the product roadmap and idea board. Um, so one thing that gets us really excited about the platform is that we're growing very fast, but that this isn't about us. There's a very large opportunity in front of us, uh, but it only really works if we, if we do this together. If we share in this opportunity, uh, and create a virtuous cycle between Slack and the developers. So Slack, while a great product on its own, only truly becomes awesome uh, when people build their workflows into Slack using the apps that you build. Um, in turn, as your apps make Slack an even more awesome place for people to work, more people promote Slack to others. 
And uh, so it goes round and round in a cycle. So um, in the interest of achieving that sort of thing, we, we want to be uh, very transparent with you about what we're doing. So uh, we're committed to openness and transparency. Uh, we would really strongly prefer not to uh, Sherlock any of our developers. We don't want to surprise you with a feature that replicates something that you're building. So that would be pretty terrible for everybody. Um, I mean, we can't make promises, obviously, but we're going to do our best to ensure that that does not happen. Um, and we want to share with you our passion for customer experience. Uh, so net promoter scores are very important for us, uh, and we want that to translate into our ecosystem. We want it to be important for you as well. So the step between being a Slack user and being a Slack paid customer is fine. Uh, but what we're really interested in is the step between being a paid customer and being somebody who promotes Slack to other people. And that's really awesome. And one of the things that makes that happen uh, are great apps. Um, and finally, as I mentioned before, the opportunity ahead of us is really, really big. Um, and we want to share that with you, uh, in part because when we share it with you, it just becomes that much bigger. So this is, this is really important to us. And so the roadmap is itself a Trello board. Uh, there's a link to this from our API website, which I'll show you later. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on all the things up here on, on this slide, but I just want to mention just some features of it. Uh, if you click on the cards, there's more detail behind them. Right? These few words that you see up here are not the extent of this roadmap. Uh, we've broken it down into time frames, near term, mid term, long term, and ongoing. What does near term, mid term, and long term mean? Well, it means near term, mid term, and long term. Um, that's what we will commit to. Um, but then they're also color coded according to, to categories. So there are categories for uh, improving the app directory and app discovery. There are categories for improving the ability to administer apps, uh, both by team administrators and by uh, app owners. Uh, and there are categories for features uh, that we want to roll out to make apps even better. So how do you get started? How can you learn more about these things? First, I encourage you to uh, visit the Slack app directory itself at slack.com slash apps. Have a look around at that website, see what people are doing and building there. Also, to have a look and see what they're not building. There's a lot of opportunity here. Uh, second, uh, on the app directory, you can find the Platform News app. Uh, <laughs> we've just recently released this. We're very excited about it. It's, uh, forget email newsletters, it's a platform newsletter directly into your Slack team. We're going to send you the latest platform news about once every two weeks. Uh, upcoming changes to the API, for example, or launches that we're very excited about. Uh, and finally, the main developer documentation website, api.slack.com, uh, where you can find everything that I've talked about here today, um, tutorials, uh, example code, uh, and most importantly, our reference documentation as well. So that's what I have for you today. I want to thank you very, very much for coming out here um, and watching me bumble through my demos. Thank you so much for your time.